sharing with us you know, some of the new Navy stuff. Um, hello, happy 2017. Uh, which purpose screen can you see or not see? I'm just going to walk around a little bit and maybe give you different perspectives, I guess. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, I, I also have some text that's low, so if you're in the front, uh, might have to stand up sometimes or else you read out. Um, all right, so this is about application security and Rails. And uh, even if application security isn't where your head is normally at, I hope that you'll enjoy the adventure. You may have heard of JSON Web Tokens. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about them, about the problems they solve, why they exist, what's in them, a little bit about that. And I hope by the end you'll have some familiarity with the, the concept, uh, some appreciation for it, and maybe uh, even a new tool for approaching application security. Uh, so I'm Lance ID. Uh, you can generally find me on the internet as Kane Levy, uh, including on this small little website that's cut in half by a, a line in the monitor. Uh, Kane Levy. Uh, currently fun of flight after eight year stint with Kickstarter. Um, and my daughter isn't old enough to join me on the presentations yet, so you're stuck with me. <laughs> uh, I've been working on an open source project for the past couple of months, and it's required me to dive deeper into sessions and application security. So this is about what I've learned. I'll start with a quick refresher on Rails sessions. Um, we'll find some way to think about the problems that we're trying to solve, and then make it a little more complicated and see if we can solve those problems again. So we'll start with a refresher on Rails sessions. Uh, the current version of Rails writes sessions as simple JSON objects. Uh, if you haven't switched to JSON objects, this is a somewhat recent change, but if you haven't switched, please consider it. There's an easy upgrade process and it fixes a potential security issue. Um, they are now both encrypted and signed. Rails stores them in a cookie that is set to be discarded whenever the browser closes, usually at the end of a, a closer browser. Yeah. Um, and they act as like a scalable storage for tiny bits of data that you don't want to keep in the database. You don't need to query against it. Uh, you just need the client to remember and get back to you later on in the application session. You don't want to keep too much. Um, they're, they're meant to be small. And really, if you want to pass information from page to page to page, uh, parameters are usually better and more restful. Um, but we still don't use them for everything. Uh, in my experience, they're basically used for the CSRF token, for flash messages, and of course, the user ID, current user of some kind. So the essence of a real session is that it's a secure message we're sending to our future selves. Um, the client just sees an opaque token, just a string of numbers and letters uh, that don't really make a lot of sense, but that's not actually a random ID. That, that is a message, and we can break it down, unpack it, and read it. So here's how it breaks down. Um, the blue is the payload. This is whatever data we're trying to pass around that's been encrypted, and then um, so that it only uses a simple character set. The pink part is the signature. Uh, we'll talk a lot about this later. And if we unencrypt and uh, load the JSON, we just get what's at the bottom, user ID 1, uh, CSRF token ABC. That's not my real CSRF token. Please, please don't <laughs> <laughs> um, But if we're going to claim that these are secure messages, we have to have some idea of what makes them secure, and what they're good at, and what they're not good at. So um, I'd like to talk about building a threat model. Uh, a threat model is a way to analyze your system security, uh, write down the things that an attacker might potentially want to do, or try to do, and create what, what amounts to like a, a QA checklist for your application. You can reference it at any time, go back through it, and say, like, are we doing these things? Are these solved problems? Uh, it really keeps you on track and lets you know that you're solving the real problems as you go. Now, I'm not applying a formal methodology in this presentation.
presentations, but those do exist. And if anyone's interested, I do recommend skimming uh, Wikipedia. Uh, it has some descriptions about how it's work. So when creating the threat model, uh, it really helps me to draw some pictures. I, I think visually. So if this helps you, here it is. Um, I just really like drawing diagrams. <laughs> If we study this diagram a little bit, um, and keep in mind that uh, these steps happen at completely different times. So step one is perhaps five, 10 minutes earlier, an hour earlier. They're, they're very disconnected steps. Um, and the server can't keep track of which one's related to which other request. It, it's really just relying on the client to be truthful. Um, so thinking about this, we can start to break down with some potential problems, things that might happen. Let's assume that we don't know how the rail sessions work, how they're secured. Let's just think about what an attacker might try to do naively. Um, well, how do we know that the token we receive in step two is the same token that we generated in step one? How do we connect those? How do we have, uh, and can we prove it? What if something happened to it while it was being passed around? Would we even know? Is the client person we gave it to in the first place? Or has, does somebody else have it now? Do we trust this person? And was the message even meant for us in the first place? Um, so going from the diagram, I write them down into a list, this, everything I just said, and uh, look at it again, try to find some patterns, because I don't know if this is a complete list. This is just what I was able to come up with while studying the diagram. Um, but when I look at this and apply all of my secret knowledge about where this presentation is going, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I come up with some patterns about uh, the different roles present in the diagram, the, the sender, the message holder, the recipients, and some concerns about different types of attacks like um, evil alternates or impersonation or tampering. So I'm just going to those into, oh, extra lines. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot more cells here than these. <laughs> I'm going to go with the original nine cells. Uh, so like, you have an evil alternate sender, for example, or a, an evil imposter recipient, or, or these kinds of combinations. And I'm just going to go through these and figure out what they might mean and what they do, and how we can, uh, how rail sessions address these problems. What do you Alternate is where you don't pretend to be somebody. Uh, you just step in and say, trust me. So if, if you're passing a message along and I come and say, I'm not Evan, but um, you should listen to me anyway, then I'm an alternate. But if I pull my hair back <laughs> and say, I am Evan, I'm an imposter. So, uh, do we know who sent the message? And this is where text is on the bottom, so I'll, I'll read it all out. Uh, do we know who sent the message, or could it have come from some kind of evil alternate? Uh, well, recall that the rail sessions are signed. That signature is generated using a secret that only we know. And if we can recreate the signature, then we must have been the ones who created the message. So that's our proof of identity. Um, and thanks to the mothers of modern cryptography, this gives us a lot of confidence. And uh, we can be sure that it's practically impossible for an evil alternate to fool us with a different secret. So we just check the signature. Okay. Can we trust whoever sent the message? Are they, are they lying about who they claim to be? Um, well, again, we know that we sent the message because we checked the signature and we trust ourselves. I'm skipping a few cells to follow the original list of questions, and then we'll go back and fill in the rest. Um, is the message intact? Could the, the holder have been compromised in some way, allowing an attacker to maybe fiddle with the message? Um, well, the signature is generated based on all of the data. So if any piece of data changes, the signature also changes, which means it won't verify and be thrown away. So, Yes, we actually can tell if this has been tampered with, and that's what the signing process does. Um, this is called HMAC, 
hash-based message authentication code. And that's the signature at the end. That's the HMAC code. So we solved this by checking the signature. <laughs> that's a lot. Um, is the holder the original owner of the message? Or is someone pretending to be the holder? Are they spoofing the original token to talk into it? And actually, our, our basic Rails sessions don't have a lot of help here. We depend on the browser to delete the cookies. And we depend on the browser to keep those cookies safe. Um, but that assumes that users actually log out or actually close their browser. And what they really might be doing is closing a tab or getting up and walking away. So are those cookies actually going away? Maybe not. Um, so if an attacker could somehow record <coughs> the session or, or take it or find it um, before it's thrown away or it's never thrown away, then uh, they could use it anytime, anywhere they wanted. Like it's still a valid session. Because it's not tied to that computer. It can be stolen. Um, a lot of our effort in Rails security goes into making sure that this doesn't happen. With SSL, um, some cookie security options like HTTP only, uh, which hides it from JavaScript entirely. Um, but if it happens, it's bad. And it's not entirely in our control. And the Rails sessions don't really give us tools for dealing with the fallout if it does happen. Um, some gems might. And a lot of common gems do try to help with these things. But out of the box, the Rails session so I don't have an answer for that. I'm using a red. The colors are pretty close. This is orange, that red. <laughs> uh, was the message meant to be sent here, or was it created for some other purpose? Well, uh, we don't expect any other secure messages coming from this cookie. So if it's in the session cookie, we assume that we put it there, and it's meant for us. And yeah, so um, we just trust. But this does hint at something. Uh, which is that the basic rail session is usually all or nothing type authorization. You are the user and you have all the access of that user. Um, if we want to limit them more, that's, that's extra homework. Okay, so what about the other boxes that we didn't fill in? Um, can we complete our list? Can we find some things that maybe didn't jump out the first time we looked at the diagram? Uh, compromise of the sender or recipient. Uh, in this diagram, we're the same person. It's the, it's the Rails application. So this is pretty bad. Um, and if we're building a threat model for the entire application, then compromise would have a lot of nuance and a lot more detail. But we're just talking about secure messages. So the risk here is that we lose control of our secret. And that somebody else can have, again, created signatures. And all of that trust that we built up by checking signatures is thrown out the door. Um, so it's all about damage control at this point. If this happens, if there is a compromise like this, then it's about damage control. We have to change our secret. We have to log everybody out. We have to go through a process that's rather manual um, and not undertaken lightly. This basically means that we don't do it unless we're certain that we absolutely have to do it because the business doesn't want us to do it. And uh, so we're only going to do it once we're certain that we've been compromised which is usually, or sometimes, quite late. Uh, it's months after the fact. We can do it, so I'm just going to mark it yellow uh, and say that we have some response. Uh, OK, so what if an attacker pretends to be the recipient, spoofs the recipient? This is basically phishing. Um, but again, we're focusing on secure messages, so let's assume that they're not trying to get passwords, they're just trying to get the message. Um, and then, you know, if they get the session, they can escalate and turn it into a, a spoofing attack. Um, so our safety mechanism here is that the message <coughs> is in a cookie. The browser handles cookies securely. We trust that. We turn on all the cookie security options, and it just doesn't happen. And this is pretty good. Like cookies are built for this. There's been a lot of work put into them to make sure that they stick. Last box, uh, what if an attacker is someone else? Um, yeah, that's a feature. It's called having multiple users <laughs> use your application uh, with different user IDs. So we just check the user ID, and great, we have um, multiple users. So this is where we end up uh, with Rails.
the sessions in this threat model. Uh, as you can see, the signature does a lot. And, and it's possible largely because of our presumed uh, monolithic architecture. Um, it's pretty straightforward to generate a, a secret in a standard Rails application. You just write it to a uh, YAML file or provision it to some environment variable and don't let it go. Um, so what happens if we add a third party? Make it a little more complicated. Uh, I'm currently working on a project called Terms and Problem, and uh, I wanted to create an open source authentication service that can be completely separate from the main application. Separate parties, sender and recipient. Uh, the idea is that it will contain the accounts data, the credentials, the usernames and passwords uh, that you can associate to users your application. Uh, this you know, removes some sensitive data, uh, related complexity, scales separately, uh, but changes less than the main application so it's more stable. A uh, big boost for anybody anticipating multiple applications or services, um, but still nice for a model. So this is our diagram. And suddenly two party rail sessions are no longer good enough. Here's a message for the app, and here's a message from IP, the identity provider. So the third party could be something like Facebook or Twitter, Google, GitHub, Keratin, you name it. Just it's, it's something that now wants to relay a secure message through an unknown uh, channel, untrusted channel, to the application. How can we trust this? How can we suddenly trust this story? It's a little different. Uh, we might consider a shared secret again, because that signature did a lot for us last time. Um, but shared secrets that are shared are less secure, because by sharing they exist in more places, and any of those places cannot be compromised. Uh, we also lose a property in security called non-repudiation. And non-repudiation means that we no longer know for certain who generated the message. It could have come from over here, or over there, or if somebody else got it, means you can deny being responsible. Non-repudiation means you can no longer deny it. It came from you. So it's an important property. Um, shared secrets are also synchronized state. If it changes in one place, it has to change in both places. And because it's a secret, uh, you have to share it between those places through something else that's secure. And so now you're adding more into the mixture. And this is usually why you go to a website, generate a token paste it into something else yourself, like the secure channel is you. <laughs> um, but that's a manual process. It's not going to happen very much. So changing keys is difficult. We'll see if we can come up with something else. Um, before getting started, I would like to reflect on Schneier's Law for a moment. Anyone from the most clueless amateur to the best cryptographer can create an algorithm that he himself So let's see what the experts are using. Let's talk about JSON web tokens. Get excited. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> uh, so JSON web tokens are a mechanism for passing secure messages. Um, and they bundle other data called claims into that message to help you parse it and understand it and make sense of it. Um, after reviewing the rail sessions, I hope you'll find them familiar. Uh, often when people refer to JSON web tokens, they actually are referring to a family of specs. Uh, uh, JWS, JWE, JWK, what they all mean. Uh, the token is a way of packaging data into a string. It's like uh, a JSON structure that's a little bit more standardized. Um, the signatures are how you sign the, the token while also annotating how you give it so somebody else can recreate. Encryption is similar, but for encryption, you uh, and JWK, JSON Web Keys, is a standard for publishing public key information in a cross-platform way. This is how we start to um, get away from shared secrets. So the JWK is going to be pretty important, and uh, I'll get more into it as we go. Previously, we saw the Rails session 
uh, is split into two parts around that double hyphen. There's the payload on, in the blue, the signature in the pink. Uh, JSON web tokens just add a third component, and they use periods instead of hyphens. Uh, the new component is the metadata. The metadata is mostly used to tell us how the signature was created so that we can recreate the process. And there, there are a few different options um, supported. Obviously, I've truncated all the components here. They're, they're much bigger. If you're interested in kind of playing with the structure of JWT and seeing how it unpacks, there's a great debugger, um, and the line is well taken at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you go to jwt.io, there's a, a wonderful web debugger that you can play with to see how it all relates. Um, the Rails session is tightly coupled with cookies. It was built into the, uh, a cookie store, is what it's called. But JSON web tokens can also be found in headers and URLs. They're just tiny things that you can pass around. I mean, they're about the same size as a real session, but that's still pretty small. Um, which means that you can be more flexible with them. You can maybe consider using them as authentication tokens for an API, passing around through a header, um, or sharing across domain because you're not restricted by cookies. Uh, comparing some of the typical contents of each. Uh, the real session, CSRF token, flash, <coughs> Uh, JWT is somewhat similar. Uh, in this case, the, I've listed five of the most essential claims that JSON web tokens make. Um, sub is a subject. The, the spec abbreviates everything to save space, to save bytes. Uh, sub is a subject that's typically used as a user ID. Um, ish, is, is the issuer. That's who sent the message, who issued the message. Uh, audience is the intended recipient. X is the timestamp of the expiration. And I at is issued at. That's when the whole thing is made. Um, and the subject is really the secure data feed. All those other four exist mostly to help us verify it and check it and make sure that we're using it correctly. Um, but JSON web tokens aren't just limited to these claims. You can add custom ones that can throw other things in. There's just a list of standard ones that you can choose from before you go having your own. Uh, and as I mentioned, they have more flexibility for generating signatures. So the HMAC signatures are nice and simple once you've decided to share a secret and go through all the provisioning process and take all the, the complexity of actually sharing the secret. Then it's easy to use. Um, how about private key pairs, though? I want to talk a little more about those because they shift the complexity around. They're a little, a little more complex to use, but easier to set up. And they have some other nice properties that we can take advantage of here. Uh, the important aspect is that the, the private key pair, uh, the private key is not shared. And the public key can be shared with literally anybody. It doesn't matter who has it. You're trying to give it to everybody. Um, the downside of this approach is that the recipient now has to get your public key somehow before it can use it. And that's where the implementation takes a little bit of complexity away from the provisioning process. I think it's a reasonable compromise, reasonable trade-off for what we get out of it. So um, putting it together, here's an example of using public-private keys with JSON web tokens, JSON web signatures, JSON web keys. So all in one diagram. I love diagrams. Uh, the private key is used to make a token. That JWT.JWS, the, the token and the signature, are sent, um, provided by the bearer to the recipient. And then the uh, public key is provided as a JWK to the recipient as well. Now the recipient has everything it needs to verify um, the endpoint to get the JWK is, is, can be standardized. So once they have your token, they, they can easily find the public key. It's just built into the spec. What's the bearer? Bearer is like the, the browser. It's just 
whoever's holding the message and presenting it on the platform. Uh, I think I called it folder before. So the, the private key is not shared. It's, it's on lockdown. It has all the same security properties as before, which is cool. Uh, oh, this is nice too. Uh, the Rails sessions <laughs> are uh, implemented in Rails. And JWT, I actually have to delete one because it's going off the screen. I forget what it was. Q, I think I deleted Q. Uh, anybody using Crystal these days? What about AppleScript? AppleScript? Not a lot. Damn, it's junk. It's time to rewrite. <laughs> All right, so let's revisit the threat model chart uh, and see how J JSON Web Zone solves these problems again. Keep in mind, the sender and recipient are no longer the same. Do we know who sent the message? Well, the message tells us. It has an issue or claim, so we can look at that. Can we trust whoever sent the message? The message is signed using one of a couple options, uh, so we can recreate the signature, same as before. Um, it's important, though, that if we're using uh, shared secrets, that the secrets are more than shared. If we're using public keys, we have to do an end run around the, the bearer, uh, which is why here, uh, I'm showing that the JSON web keys are, are passing through some kind of back channel, uh, because we don't want to trust the bearer to know where the public key is, then they're in control. Um, what if the secret was stolen? Uh, still sucks, but uh, public key means that we can now implement key rotation. So the, the JWS spec allows for a key ID in the metadata. You can say, like, I use key number one or key number two or key number three. And that means that when they fetch the, the JSON web key set, they know which one to use. This means that we can have multiple active switch to a new one, phase out the old one, and do it automatically and seamlessly. We can set this up so it happens without us being involved at all, uh, which means that even though this is still damage control, you've been compromised, it sucks, but damage control means that you could set up rotation to happen daily, and uh, it may really cut short the window of attack um, before you even notice. Uh, what if an attacker is someone else? This is still a feature, but we can read the subject Are they the original owner? Um, yeah, so th on this one, we don't, we don't know for certain that they're the original owner, but uh, JSON Web Tokens have expiration dates. And um, these expiration dates actually are what help us rotate keys because uh, as soon as the expiration is over for keys, we can swap out new ones. But if the expiration claim is respected, then after this window of, uh, of attack, messages will be lost and they can't do any more. Uh, you may be thinking it's a little awkward to just cut a session short without letting them continue. Uh, that is awkward. Uh, you can set up what's called a refresh token. OAuth calls these access tokens and refresh tokens. Uh, the refresh token is something that is a little more private but can be used at any time to get a fresh access token. So as long as your application is just aggressively like getting fresh access tokens, uh, you won't actually run into the expiration. But if any one of those is lost, then it's useless. If the message is attacked, uh, once again we're signing it. <laughs> signing is based on all the data in the token. If any of it changes, the signature doesn't work. Same as before. Uh, was the message meant to be sent here? Uh, JSON web tokens include an audience claim. They say who they're intended for. So we'll just check it. Uh, what if an attacker pretends to be the recipient? Uh, right, this is, about, this is the one where they're maybe stealing the message and trying to reuse it. Uh, well, if you're using cookies, which you can, then it's the same answer as before. You turn on the secure options for your cookies and trust them. Uh, otherwise, it's up to you. I, you wouldn't want to have them 
as a global header for all of your jQuery uh, H XHR requests, and then accidentally forget and send one to a untrusted domain. Just uh, make sure you're only sending it to yourself. But um, if an attacker does get those tokens, again, we can be confident that they'll expire soon and be less useful. Uh, and what if the recipient was compromised? Um, well, before we were worried about the secret being stolen, but if you're using public keys, there's no secret. There's nothing to steal. I mean, the recipient is still in a bad way because they've been compromised, but the messages are safe. Right, so what's changed? Uh, well, this, this still works. If the sender and the recipient are different, if you have a three party system, it still works. Uh, and that's um, there's no shared secret. There's a little more um, security there. Uh, we have some better damage control mechanisms built in by expiring tokens, by isolating who has control of the secret. Um, but note that all of these answers were based on a particular implementation. The token itself doesn't do the security. The token just provides the means to do secure things. So we're taking advantage of the expiration claim and building a refresh mechanism so it's not awkward. But that's a little bit of work. Uh, we're, we're choosing to use public keys instead of shared secrets. That's nice. It lets us do rotation, but it's a little different. Um, and we're relying on the recipient to really make good choices and do all of these things. And that bears some repeating. Uh, I think OAuth is commonly criticized for being difficult to implement securely as a client, like perfectly according to spec. Um, and I think it turns out that distributed secure messages are just tricky, and it's a hard problem. So uh, this is what this is what it takes. Um, please use a library. Like they exist on all the platforms; <laughs> they're available everywhere. So use one. Uh, but this is what you should expect the library to be doing. Checking the issuer to make sure it's expected. Checking the audience to make sure it's expected. Checking to make sure that the token hasn't expired. Verifying the signature. And only then returning the contents in silence. So we talked about JSON graph tokens, uh, sessions, threat models, and some gloriously paranoid security questions. Um, can we make it practical? What can we do with these? Uh, what if you're not using a three-party system with an external authentication provider? All right, so some ideas. Uh, we could just rename user ID. <laughs> call it sub instead, and that'd be nice. Uh, we can make our sessions expire from Rails. Uh, Devise has a module that does this, uh, the timestamp. It'll refresh the session every time it's used. Um, it can be better than that, like the uh, refresh mechanism should be separate, but that's still nice, that's an improvement. Um, we could add CSRF tokens to the JWTs them to set up rail sessions. Nothing wrong with that. Um, the sessions aren't magical. They're just secure messages. And so are JSON web tokens. Um, and my favorite is actually creating uh, limited use logins. Like um, password resets, right? You send someone an email, and when they click on the link in that email, you basically want them to take an action as if they were some user. Well, uh, if you add a scope claim to your JSON web token, you can send that as a password reset token. It doesn't have to match, suddenly the token doesn't have to be in the database, right? It's a secure message. And the secure message says, whoever presents this token is allowed to change their password as if they were user number five. Uh, and you can take that same idea and do some other things in emails maybe like like in a post, um, following someone back if, if they follow you on the 
website, um, uh, maybe opting in or out of a newsletter, or answering a survey. These kinds of limited things that people want to be able to do from an email in a nice way uh, without having to log in. Um, if you do try any of these, I've, or, or you have ideas or questions on your own, I'd love to hear them. I'd love to talk about them. Uh, I'm on DX Ruby Slack as <coughs> Kane Lovey. Um, and here's some searches for things you might find interesting, uh, different parts of the presentation. Uh, GWT.io as a debugger. Uh, HMAC is a shared secret model. Uh, threat model is just more ways to think about security and create that checklist. Digital signature is the Wikipedia page that talks about um, the public key signing process that I described. And Schneier's Law. Always good to keep in mind if you design security systems. All right, that is all. is the external authentication provider. So uh, you can connect it to your application. It takes care of passwords. So it, it would just went over what part of that? Like it, 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 should it returns, it returns a token that acts as a session. Uh, it returns, like you, you send the username and password to Keratin. It returns a token to the client. And the client can then give that to your application and say, here's who I am. And as long as you know which Keratin server you're using, <coughs> it knows that it's generating them for you. You can verify all of those things and trust that session. So it's a sender? It's a sender, yeah. Right. What, is it available for people to use? Um, I would call it alpha right now. It is, um, yeah, there's a website, parenting.tech. And a GitHub organization, um, there's a uh, implementation for Backends, JavaScript frontends. Let me let you know. Um, and uh, I've, I've built it into some sample applications. I'm building it into your more mature application next. So uh, you're welcome to follow along and ask questions. Yeah. Uh, oh, what's the what's the actual mechanism for like doing the the key? public key discovery and exchange, say yeah. in Keratin or in other examples? Yeah, so uh, OpenID, the latest OpenID is called OpenID Connect. And it's based on OAuth 2. Uh, OpenID Connect says that you have to publish the URL of your JSON web keys in the metadata available to anyone who knows that you are an OpenID provider. So as an OpenID provider, we must respond to this URL. It must contain a key that points to your JSON web keys. So they can look at your issuer, add the path that they know, because you follow the spec. And from that, get everything. Good question. Yeah? How much effort would it take to integrate Keratin into my monolith or set of apps? And um, do I have to use like Keratin servers or something? Yeah, it is the server. It is the API for um, this stuff. Uh, it depends on your stack. We have to talk about it. In the back. Uh, so you mentioned uh, like a possible idea is putting TSR up The question is, if you want to add custom claims to the JSON web token, um, is that simple, hard? Do you have to go register that somewhere? Maybe. Uh, and the spec just says uh, there are standard claims that are built into the spec. There's a set of other claims that people have registered with the central authority. So you can go look up what other people are doing and maybe reuse their claims in the same way. Or there's a private section. And in that private section of the token, it's 
fair game. You don't have to tell anybody. And you have to tell yourself and use it the way you whatever. Just like a session. How do you determine the duration of the Is it variable? Yeah. Um, something short. Shorter is better? Shorter is better. means that you can you can decide how far into that one hour you wait before refreshing. So I pick 30 minutes. I call it the half-life strategy. When token is, is <coughs> half-life, get a new one. Uh, you could choose one day and it would really reduce the number of refreshes. But the refreshes are lightweight. Basically you have a session with the As long as that session is active, that is your refresh. Um, but that session can also be revoked, so if you log out, then that can't be stolen either. So a couple nice things there. Shorter is better. But if it's too short, then it might have some weird log out behavior. So I have to say it was variable as well. Or? It is variable. Sorry, I have a better way to think about it. Um, think of it as timeout for if they close their browser tab. Like how long are you willing to, to wait before assuming they're not coming back? Right. Think about your timeout. Okay. Uh, if you have any other questions, I'm sure you can find Lance elsewhere. On Slack. Slack. And then on, here. on the Slack and Twitter as well. Yeah. Also a game audience. What about Snapchat? <laughs> 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 I'm not hip with those.